Martin Lecture has been an almost annual event here at Notre Dame <laughs> since 1984. Last year was the only year we missed for obvious reasons, sadly. But we are here together in person and without masks, so that's a great thing. And yes, there will be desserts served in the lobby after this, so we're making progress. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. It's really good, good to see you all here together. I would be remiss uh, if I didn't say a word of deep thanks to those who have made this night possible. Katie Nieser is out there somewhere. Thank you, Katie, for making the arrangements for us tonight. <laughs> and I want to thank the members of the Martin family. Unfortunately, none of them could be with us this night. And I'm sad about that because I would love for you to meet them. The John S. Martin program in homiletics and liturgics was begun in 1984 with a gift from John S. and Virginia Martin. Uh, sadly, John Martin died in 1985, I believe it was. But his uh, wife, Virginia, is still very much alive, lives in Indianapolis, and sometimes uh, does join us here for various events. So I know that they are wishing they could be here with us tonight. Pretty sure they're going to watch the video, though, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Our speaker tonight probably wishes he was at home in Miami, Florida, <laughs> but we are honored to have him here with us, and we wish that your wife, Carol, could be with us as well. John Fitzgerald uh, completed an MDiv degree at the Yale Divinity School. Later, he returned to Yale University, where he received his PhD in New Testament in 1984. For more than three decades, he was a faculty member in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida, where he also held various administrative positions, including department chair. Since 2012, he has been professor of New Testament and early Christianity here in the Department of Theology, here at the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Fitzgerald is the author of more than 85 articles and more than 170 book notes or reviews. He's also the author, editor, or co-editor of 11 books. His lecture this evening, as you know, is entitled, The Preacher as Time Traveler. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. John T. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me to, to give this lecture and for that gracious introduction. I did not realize what power you had. You know, uh, the day before the lecture, I'm thinking, how will I do this with a mask on? And lo and behold, uh, I'm not through. Uh, sure, whether it was through prayer or threats or blackmail, but uh, you were able to get the mask mandate uh, for us tonight lifted, and we'll even be able to have something to graze on uh, after I have finished my remarks. I would like to add as well my thanks to the Martin family for their generosity in helping Notre Dame establish the John S. Martin program in homiletics and liturgics and in making the Martin Lecture possible. I would also like to thank all of you in the audience for your presence on a chilly evening in early February. As Mike's reference to Miami should indicate, your speaker is a Miami weather wimp. 
Um, and I would much rather be on the beach uh, in my shorts and my t-shirt uh, than here, but you've got me, so I'm here. Uh, but your presence shows your recognition of the importance of preaching in the life and work of the church and your desire to encourage and nourish effective uh, preaching. My hope and prayer are that tonight's remarks will be a contribution toward that goal. I want to begin by talking about time travel. It's an old concept found initially in various myths and legends about certain people journeying to heaven or falling asleep and discovering that when they turned to earth or awoke, that many years had passed. For example, Epimenides of Crete, who is probably quoted anonymously in both Acts 17 and Titus 1, was said to have fallen asleep for 57 years in a Cretan cave sacred to Zeus. And when he awoke, he discovered that he had been given the gift of prophecy. In Jewish tradition, both the Babylonian and the Jerusalem Talmuds preserve the story of Hani the circle drawer, who fell asleep for many decades and woke up in the future. All such stories are, pre are precursors to what many of us today know best as the Rip Van Winkle story. In his 1819 short story, the American author Washington Irving narrates the tale of Rip Van Winkle, a Dutch-American villager living in colonial America. Rip meets a mysterious Dutchman who give him liquor to drink, and he falls asleep in the Catskills Mountains. After 20 years, he awakes to a very different world, having missed the American Revolution. The moral of the story is obviously, be careful when a Dutchman offers to buy you a drink. <laughs> The idea of traveling back in time is more modern and has frequently been used in novels and works of science fiction. One thinks above all of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, published in 1843 and often made into various movies. As most of us will recall, the protagonist of the story, Ebenezer Scrooge, travels to both the past and the future as well as making rounds through the present. His travels, made possible by the spirits of Christmas's past, present, and yet to come, transform his life and result in him ceasing to be a self-centered miser and becoming a generous and caring person. The idea of time machines as the means for time travel was popularized by H.G. Wells in his 1895 science fiction novella, The Time Machine. Those of my generation, however, will likely think first not of Wells, but of three movies starring Ma Michael J. Fox. <laughs> back to the Future, Back to the Future 2, and Back to the Future 3. It's easy to keep the title straight when you do that. The time machine here was a special DeLorean car, which had been retrofitted with a flux capacitor that made time travel possible. Such is time travel in film and fiction. But that is not the kind of time travel that I have in mind when I say that effective scripture-based preaching requires homilists to be time travelers. The time travel of which I speak does not require a DeLorean vehicle or a flux capacitor, but rather an ability to, to commute between the centuries on a regular basis. The goal is to bring knowledge of scripture and the wisdom of the ages to bear in the proclamation of the word of God, so that parishioners and others may encounter and experience God and be sustained by our creator. Let me be clear at the outset on a crucially important point. I am not talking about preachers taking an express train back to Moses, to Isaiah, to Jesus, to the Apostle Paul, or any other person mentioned in the Bible and then taking an express train back to the present day. That would be not only short-sighted, but foolish. It would squander the opportunity to have one's insights in preaching be nourished by the theological treasures of past generations of believers. Make a point of stopping off in all of your various, in all the various centuries that separate you from the text you intend to proclaim. 
Theologians and preachers have, from previous generations and context have much to teach us, if we will but listen. One of the great ironies in the history of theology is that those who sought to speak and provide solutions for all time have less to say to us than those who focused on their own time. Those who did that the most effectively are the greatest resources, precisely because we can see how and why they were so effective in their preaching. A second and related point of emphasis is this. And I say this especially to the students here. Do not neglect any area of study because all areas have something to teach you. We have six areas of teaching and research in our Department of Theology, and all of them can and should inform and enrich your preaching. That includes not only biblical studies, which I will, of course, emphasize in this lecture, but also history of Christianity, liturgical studies, moral theology, systematic theology, and world religions, world church. It is the area that you neglect that one day will bite you on the tush and make you wish that you had been more attentive and ambitious in that course. Let me illustrate this point with a personal story from my undergraduate days. This will not be a story that will do much credit for me, but nonetheless, uh, you can learn from my experience. Like many of you, I attended a university that had so-called distribution requirements as part of its curriculum. This particular school did not specify when I had to take these required courses that would fulfill these distribution requirements. They just mandated that students had to do them if they wanted to graduate. And I did want to graduate. My father insisted that I graduate. The key question for students was thus, whether to go ahead and take such courses and get them out of the way, or to postpone them to the bitter end. One of those requirements that I had postponed was a biology requirement, which I put off in hopes that God would somehow rescue me from that dire fate. After all, God had delivered Daniel from the lion's den, so surely he would deliver me from the torturous exams of Doxers, Shake, and Stevens. But alas, my senior year came, and the requirement of two biology courses had not been abolished. I was going to learn biology whether I wanted to or not. I ended up marrying a biologist, so. <laughs> but alas, my senior year came, and to make matters worse, special biology courses designed for humanities majors did not yet exist. So I had to enroll in courses that were filled by pre-med majors and budding scientists. I have repressed or forgotten everything about that first biology course with Dr. Shake. All I remember is that it met, you ready for this? At seven o'clock in the morning which may have scarred me for all time. The second course with Dr. Stevens was more memorable. He was a great teacher, a kind gentleman, but his tests were quite demanding. I still recall acing the first exam, yes, which unfortunately resulted in me getting overly confident about my abilities in the course and the time required to learn the material. The second exam brought me back to earth and to reality. I entered the exam room woefully unprepared, and the first question that I could answer was found on page five of the exam. I still recall my score on the test, a 12. <laughs> the lowest grade I ever made on any exam in my academic career, but even more painful was the shame I felt at having let Dr. Stevens down. I ultimately passed both courses with decent grades, but the truth is, I really didn't learn that much. 
Then came a course at Yale Divinity School, Biomedical Ethics. There were 15 students in the class, five from the Divinity School, five from the Yale Law School, and five from the Yale Medical School, and two professors, one a Jewish psychiatrist and the other a Roman Catholic nun. It was one of the best courses I ever took. But early on, it became clear to me that I could not make informed ethical decisions about many cases if I did not have a much better understanding of human anatomy and physiology. So at long last, I learned the basic biology that those two undergraduate courses were intended to provide. The moral of the story, learn as much as you can in every course that you take here, because each course will be useful to you in carrying out your ministries, and that includes the ministry of preaching. Your time travel as preachers will always begin in the present. To preach effectively, you must know the people to whom you will be preaching. To the extent that it is possible, you need to know them the hopes and fears they have for themselves and for their families, the problems that they are dealing with, and the concerns that they have. Such knowledge is acquired naturally through interacting with them, counseling and advising them, and living among them. Trust me, if you do that, you will know your audience. I'm always flabbergasted when I hear someone claim that clergy are naive idealists who have no understanding of the real world. And I always say to myself when I hear such nonsense, are you kidding me? Along with police officers, they have one of the best understandings of the real world, precisely because they're dealing with people struggling within that world. The difference is that they believe in God and the power of God to transform even the most recalcitrant among us. Furthermore, you will need to assess the biblical literacy of your audience. As you will discover, some parishes are far more biblically literate than others. Some will know, for example, to whom you're referring when you talk about Abraham, whereas others will be like the freshman student in a course that one of my friends taught. After my friend had finished his lecture on chapters 12 to 25 of Genesis, one student came up to him and praised him for delivering such a riveting lecture. He had learned far more about Abraham than he thought possible. What knowledge! And my friend was feeling quite pleased with himself until the student made it clear that he thought that my friend had been lecturing on Abraham Lincoln. So, based on your knowledge of the people to whom you and others are ministering, ask yourself collectively, what is their profile? If Peter or Paul or James were alive today, what message would they deliver to your audience? The gospel is God's power to heal. But if you don't know where and how people are hurting, you will not know where to apply that healing ointment. You need to remember that some New Testament writers draw explicitly on medical language to describe Christian teaching as healthy teaching that promotes spiritual health and a spiritually vibrant life. I recall reading a story many years ago about the famous American evangelist Billy Graham, who was well known for his campaigns. Now, you might think that Graham's success as an evangelist was tied simply to his oratorical skill and ability co to connect with his audiences. To be sure, that was important, but more was involved. He sought to learn as much as he could about the cities where he held his campaigns. Some six months to a year before he campaigned in a city, 
he took out a subscription to the local newspaper for their Sunday edition. He read those newspapers, he talked to pastors in those cities, and when he arrived for his campaign, he did so with a keen awareness of that particular city's problems, its attitudes, and its perspectives. And he crafted his sermons to speak first and foremost to those audiences. And since the problems of particular cities tended to be shared by other cities, he spoke to people far beyond the original audience of listeners. So having begun in the present, Commute back to the biblical worlds. This is where your courses in scripture come in. They are intended to lay a foundation for your ministries and especially for that of preaching. You need to know the biblical text and the various ways of studying them. The different theories and methods used in biblical studies are designed to answer different kinds of questions about the biblical text and there is no way of predicting in advance precisely which of these theories and methods may be the most useful to you in explicating a given text for modern audiences. Scripture scholars traditionally devote a lot of time to these exegetical and interpretive tools because these diverse theories and methods are the tools of the biblical trade. And we make no apologies for requiring you to know them. But please note, these tools are to be used by you in your study. By all means, do not use them in the pulpit. Let me illustrate. When I go to the florist in search of flowers for my wife on Valentine's Day, and yes, I've already ordered them, or on some other occasion, I do not expect or want the florist to show me her tools. I don't want to see her floral clippers, her netting and floral tape, nor do I want to see the pruning shears or the thorn clippers she may have used, nor the floral frog that she may have set in the bottom of the vase, nor any other floral accessories. And I certainly do not want to see the fertilizer or insecticide that she or the flower farmer elected to use to grow the flowers. Rather, show me the flowers themselves. In a similar way, show me in your sermons the flowers that your textual study, your concordance work, your use of commentaries, and other things have produced. Sermons like trees are known by their fruits, and effective scripture-based preaching will present the fruits of your study and your application of those fruits to today's issues and concerns. So let me offer two illustrations of what you may find useful in preaching. First, let's say that your sermon text for the day is the story of the Good Samaritan. It may be that some in your audience will know only the first definition of the phrase found in a typical dictionary, which is that a Good Samaritan is a charitable or helpful person the kind of person who hands the cashier a dollar bill on your behalf when you discover that you are short of change, or more recently, who will help you out of the snow when your car gets stuck. Others will know that the origin of the phrase is the protagonist in Jesus' story, which is found only in the Gospel of Luke. And some may recall that the, the extraordinary assistance that he renders to the victim in the story, a brutally mugged traveler, is vividly contrasted with the lack of assistance given by a priest and a Levite to Jewish temple functionaries. The hero in Jesus' story is a Samaritan, a person from Samaria, whose actions function as the model for how a good neighbor should act towards anyone in need. The narrative in which the story of the Good Samaritan occurs ends with Jesus' exhortation, go and do likewise. The story is a useful reminder that we as Christians often love what Jesus says, but we gag at what he means. Too often we are like that good church lady from Alabama whom I saw interviewed on TV a couple of years ago. 
She argued that no help at all should be given to immigrants and refugees, saying that when Jesus spoke of helping our neighbors, he meant people like us, not them foreigners. And I'm quoting directly. No, my dear church lady, that was not what Jesus meant. His parable valorized the good actions done not only by a foreigner, someone that the Luke and Jesus elsewhere calls a person of a different race, but also one that came from a part of the Holy Land that was often despised and vilified by many people. To drive this point home, you may want to devote part of your sermon to the hostile feelings that all too often characterized Jewish-Samaritan relations. There were certainly reasons on both sides for the strained relations that often, but not always, existed. The religious differences between the two groups account for many of the hostilities. Judea and Samaria, at one point, each had a temple at which prayers and sacrifices to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were offered. They were rival temples, with members of each group often viewing the other temple as illegitimate. Furthermore, each group had a different version of the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, to which they turned to discern the word of God and to learn the divine will. Each group, of course, had its own list of grievances. From a Jewish perspective, there was an awareness that certain Samaritans once had snuck into the Jerusalem temple and scattered bones throughout the temple, polluting the temple and rendering it unclean. Other Samaritans had attacked Jewish pilgrims traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem. Naturally, there was resentment at such actions. The Samaritans, for their part, recalled times when certain Jews had attacked and raided Samaritan villages, and above all, there was the memory of a Jewish high priest who had attacked and destroyed the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim. You want to tick someone off? Burn their temple down. All of these were factors, all of these factors formed the background for Jesus' decision to cast a foreigner of a different race and from an often hated religious group as the hero in his story. It would be like today telling the story to a group of Christians who are American white nationalists and making the hero of the story a Muslim refugee from the Middle East or Indonesia. One of the major points of Jesus' story is that this Samaritan did not let the history of racial and religious hostility stop him from showing mercy to a person who desperately needed it. And Jesus asked us to go and to do likewise. For a second illustration, I shall use Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. We do not know from where Paul wrote that letter, but we do know he was incarcerated when he wrote it. That's an important fact to appreciate when preaching on that letter. Your audience will likely already know about the most famous modern letter written by an incarcerated person in America, which is that of, doc of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King had been arrested on Good Friday in April of 1963 and placed in a Birmingham jail. The police commissioner who did that lived two blocks from me. I grew up in Birmingham. King's letter from the Birmingham City Jail, written four days after his arrest, was a response to a statement signed by eight prominent white religious leaders who had denounced protest led by outsiders and called upon the, American, or the African American community to withdraw support from Dr. King and others like him. Dr. King's letter was a defense of his methods for fighting injustice and one of the most important documents of the American Civil Rights Movement. But what about Paul's letter? And how does our awareness that it was written from prison affect our understanding of it? 
To begin with, we need to understand the vast differences between ancient prisons and our own. There was nothing in antiquity, for example, that corresponds to our distinction between jail and prison. Nor was there anything like our distinction between maximum security prison and so-called country club prisons for white collar criminals. Nor were there correctional facilities for juveniles and prisons for adults. Youthful offenders were incarcerated right along with adults and the elderly. Furthermore, there were not separate facilities for men and women. At best, women may sometimes have been kept in a place separate from the men, but they were often locked up together with them. Modern prisons tend to be built away from urban areas so that if prisoners escape, they will not pose an immediate threat to people living in the vicinity. Roman prisons, by contrast, were generally built near the Forum, thus in the center of town. That was true not only in the city of Rome, but of Roman towns in general. Sentences for a fixed period of time, say two or five or 20 years, or life sentences, are fairly common today, but essentially unknown in antiquity. In a similar way, time off for good behavior, early releases because of good conduct or overcrowding, and paroles are all foreign to antiquity. So too is the modern idea that one purpose of incarceration is moral reformation, the hope that detention may lead to penitence and reform. Thus, one of the euphemisms for places of incarceration, especially for youthful offenders, is a reformatory. Moral reformation may have occurred sometimes in antiquity, but ancient sources reflect little or no concern with the potential moral reformation of prisoners. What about the physical layout of ancient prisons? Prisons could be independent buildings or parts of buildings with other parts devoted to other purposes. Internally, there is no knowledge, there is no evidence to my knowledge of individual cells. Prisons appear to be communal with overcrowding one of the recurring laments. Furthermore, and this is very important, the vast majority of these prisons were located underground, which led to the frequent comparison of imprisonment with life in Hades. There are a number of other factors related to this reality. Think about being placed underground. There was pers persistent darkness even during the day. Prisoners were deprived of sunlight. It was typically hot and stuffy during the summer, cold or freezing during the winter. There was little or no ventilation with opportunities for bathing typically rare. This meant that the stench from unwashed bodies and human feces was often overwhelming. The securest and most physically bleak part of any prison was the so-called inner, or innermost prison. That was the portion of the prison in Philippi, where, according to Acts 16, Paul and Silas were placed after their arrest. Ancient prisons were infamous for being torture chambers. Prisoners appear to have been constantly in chains, sometimes chained together, and at night, stocks were often used as a means of intensified restraint. Prisoners were tortured by being flogged or clawed or being placed on a rack and having their limbs stretched or by burning them with hot metal objects or boiling pitch. In addition to being places of torture, they were also places of execution. Strangling, beheading, and hanging were the three most common prison house means of execution. As far as the prisoners' food and drink were concerned, suffice it to say that the portions were small and not very nutritious. In addition to the standard bread and water, prisoners were sometimes given soup and greens, and there was no nice last meal. As this description of a typical ancient prison implies, they were often hell holes, 
So we should not be surprised that the physical appearance of prisoners changed over time, with them becoming filthier and more disheveled in appearance the longer they were incarcerated. Malnutrition, starvation, and death are, as a result of imprisonment were common. Prisoners had other worries to concern them, and they contributed to their frequent laments about sleeplessness. One worry, remember it's communal, was the fear of being attacked either by a prison guard or another prisoner. We have evidence for both murder and rape in prison. So given the conditions of imprisonment and the dangers of being attacked, how well would you sleep? Probably with one eye open and not very well. And that is precisely what many of them did. Finally, is it any surprise, given such horrific conditions, and what I've said should make you uncomfortable, <laughs> that humans were subjected to that kind of degradation? Should it be any surprise to us that some prisoners opted for suicide? The Stoics, in fact, gave imprisonment as one of the seven circumstances under which they believed that the sage, the wise man, might choose suicide as a rational act. Paul's letter to the Philippians was written under such circumstances. And thus, on opening and reading it for the first time, we might expect him to be utterly depressed. I certainly would have been. But that is not at all what we discover. It is, in fact, Paul's most joyful letter, brimming with joy despite the degrading and dangerous conditions of prison life. Rejoice in the Lord always, he says, and he continues, I shall say it again, rejoice. Your kindness should be known to all. Have no anxiety at all, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Instead of being consumed with anger and the desire for vengeance, his mind is filled with thoughts about what is good and right. He tells the Philippians, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Finally, instead of feeling the shame and humiliation that were usually associated with incarceration, Paul considers it an honor, indeed a grace, that he has received. He considers it a privilege not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer for him. And he encourages the Philippians to view their own suffering in a similar way. He says, this is God's doing. For to you it has been granted for the sake of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. It's an extraordinary letter coming from such detestable conditions. In addition to paying close attention to the content of the biblical text and the context in which it was written, let me also encourage you to focus as you prepare your sermons on the manner in which the text is written. So if your text is part of a narrative, how has the biblical author chosen to narrate the story? What literary techniques has he used? Biblical writers employ a number of literary and especially narrative techniques, and these can often be suggestive for what you might do in a sermon. I shall talk tonight about two of these techniques. The first is a technique that is probably most familiar to us from modern film. In the world of film, it is often called cross-cutting which is an editing technique used to show scenes or actions that are happening at the same time. This is often achieved by the camera switching back and forth from one scene or character to another. Scriptwriters and screenwriters often use the term intercut for the same phenomenon. By inserting the word intercut in all caps into their screenplays, 
They're telling the director and camera people to alternate from one scene to another so that viewers will understand that the action is happening simultaneously. The same technique occurs in ancient text. Often when the writer wants to give the reader a clue that two different stories are happening simultaneously, or at least should be read in light of each other. The scholar from whom I learned about this literary technique called it intercalation, but it's basically what I would call the sandwich technique. You have two stories, which we can call story A and story B. You can tell story A first and then tell story B, or you can tell story B first and then tell story A. But what if you want to give the reader a clue that these two stories in fact belong together and should be read together. Then you can cut story A in two pieces. That is, you start telling story A, but you don't finish it. You then tell story B in its entirety, then you narrate the rest of story A. One of our gospel writers who uses this technique is Mark, who intercalates the stories of Jesus' trials, Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin, and Peter's denials of Jesus. When we place these two stories alongside each other, we see a number of striking similarities as well as startling differences. <clears throat> and this is where, Mike, I should have asked for an AV equipment, but I, I didn't know that I would be using this illustration. So we'll do it, verbal. We'll do it completely verbally. First of all is the setting of these two stories. Jesus is inside in the courtroom whereas Peter is right outside in the courtyard. Inside, Jesus is being fiercely grilled by the high priest, whereas Peter is safely outside, warming himself by a blazing fire. Inside, the chief interrogator is the high priest, the most powerful religious leader in the country. He will speak twice to Jesus. Outside, the first person who interrogates Peter is that same high priest, slave girl. She too will speak twice, once to Peter and once about him. And whereas Jesus inside hangs tough in the face of intense scrutiny, outside Peter, the rock, immediately cracks and crumbles into pebbles as a result of a slave girl's questions and assertions. Inside the substance of the trial, the issue at stake, is Jesus' identity. Who is he? Is he the Messiah? Outside the key question. In Peter's interrogation is also his identity. Whose is he? Is he Jesus' disciple? There are witnesses both inside and outside. Inside, those who give testimony, those who testify, give false testimony in hopes of providing evidence to convict Jesus. Outside, there are those those who speak are also witnesses, but their testimony is true. Peter is indeed a Galilean who has not only been with Jesus, but is one of the, of the disciples in his cohort. Finally, the decisive action occurs. Inside, Jesus comes clean. And for the first and only time in the entire Gospel of Mark, he publicly confesses his true identity, which earlier had been shrouded in secrecy. Here, the Messiah incognito lifts the veil and discloses that he is indeed the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One. And he does so knowing full well that his confession will cost him his life. Outside, Peter doggedly and emphatically persists in denying his true identity. In Mark's gospel, all of the disciples, including Peter, are depicted in a negative fashion and as failing to understand or accept Jesus' teaching. But here, Peter denies what he knows to be the truth. He does the very thing that only a short time before he had vehemently, he had vehemently denied he would ever do. And there are two things he does that make his failure even worse. First, he gets a warning. Only in Mark's gospel does the cock crow twice. 
And Peter persists, despite the warning of the first cock crow, to deny any association with Jesus. Second, when he makes his third denial, he compounds his mistake by both cursing and swearing an oath. Damn it, I swear to God that I don't know the man you're talking about. If the false witnesses inside the courtroom are, are guilty of giving false testimony, a legal offense, Peter's false oath makes him guilty of perjury, a religious offense against God. He has taken God's name in vain. Inside, we now hear the verdict. Based on Jesus' own confession, he is found guilty, and the recommended sentence is unanimous. He deserves death. Outside, Peter's three denials have been geared to avoid the verdict rendered inside and to save his miserable life. The second time the cock crows prompts Peter's memory of what Jesus had said a few hours earlier, and thus delivers the verdict. Peter is guilty of denying Jesus, and he knows the sentence that he deserves for his religious crime. It had been stated by Jesus himself in Mark 8, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. What profit is there for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? What could one give in exchange for his life? Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this faithless and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. No wonder Peter breaks down and cries with tears streaming down his face. All hell is pounding within his heart. Back inside, the convicted Jesus is now mocked, which is occasioned by a prophecy he has just uttered. That is, not only does he admit to being God's son, the Messiah, but he also speaks a word about the future. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. How ludicrous, they think, and mockingly ask to hear more of these fantasies. Prophesy, they say. Outside in the courtyard, of course, one of Jesus' earlier prophecies has just come true. A fulfillment that assures us as readers that his prophecy about his second coming will also come true. As these similarities and differences in these two intertwined stories suggest, Jesus is not the only one on trial. Peter is also on trial, but his behavior is the exact opposite to that of Jesus. Whereas Jesus passes this crucial test, Peter fails and does so miserably. Despite Peter's failure and that of the other disciples, Jesus does not renounce them. Instead, he proceeds to die for them, doing so not when they are at their best and brightest, but when they are at their absolute worst. They are not worthy to have a good man die for them, much less the Son of God. Yet Jesus dies for them, not because they deserve it, but because they need for him to do so. In preaching about such a text, we need to emphasize that just like Peter and the other disciples, we too fail, even when we want to be faithful and heroic. Like the disciples, we are the recipients of grace and mercy, the power that makes discipleship possible. The second technique is far more widespread in ancient literature, and indeed, it is already found in Homer. It is the technique that the Greeks called by different names, but the most common term they used for it was inargeia, by which they meant vivid description. The goal of vivid description is to make readers spectators of the events about which they are reading. Plutarch is but one ancient author who compares writers and painters, and he argues that the goal is the same for each one. In one of his works, he says that, quote, the most effective historian is he who, by a vivid representation of emotions and characters, 
makes his narration like a painting, end of quote. And he holds up Thucydides as an historian who used this technique effectively. He says, assuredly, Thucydides is always striving for this vividness in his writing, since it is his desire to make the reader a spectator, as it were, and to produce vividly in the minds of those who peruse his narrative the emotions of amazement and consternation which were experienced by those who beheld them firsthand. This is quite similar to what some modern literary critics call immersion, by which they mean that readers become so immersed in the narrative that they not only identify with certain characters, but also experience the same emotions that they do. The same phenomenon happens when we watch certain films. We are anxious as the woman on the screen who is walking down a poorly lit street at night in a dangerous neighborhood. We are pushing along with a lifeguard as she strives to resuscitate a child who is a drowning victim. And we breathe along with her into the child's mouth. In a similar way, we jump and shout with the underdogs who have miraculously pulled off an upset. What the ancients realized about vivid description is that it draws us as readers into the story. Through it, we become not only witnesses of the event, but participants in it. By means of vivid description, we are persuaded, both cognitively and emotionally, of the truth in the narrative, because we have witnessed it and participated in it. In Hellenistic philosophy, in Argea, is conceptually linked to truth claims and to criteria for establishing the, the truth. Against this backdrop, it becomes quite clear why a writer like the third evangelist makes such an extensive use of vivid description in Luke Acts. He does so because it is one of the means by which he can persuade Theophilus and other readers of the truth of what he is narrating. He wants such readers to be assured of the certainty of what they have been taught. Take, for example, Luke's depiction of the call of the first disciples. To be candid, there is little that is vivid about Mark's description of that call. Peter and Andrew, then James and John are called sequentially, and Jesus tells both Peter and Andrew that they will henceforth be fishing for people. But in Luke, this story becomes not the call of the first four, but the call of Peter. Luke, James, and John, to be sure, are still there, but they remain in the background. Luke shines the spotlight on Peter, who becomes the first disciple to call Jesus Lord. And it is he alone, not he and his brother Andrew, who will be fishing for people. We know from the outset that he will not be perfect. And Jesus knows that reality better than Peter himself does. But through Luke's artful narration, we witness Peter's call, we experience his emotions, and we also, albeit faintly, begin to hear Jesus calling us to be his disciples as well. Effective scripture-based preaching, I want to argue, makes use of vivid description. It often draws on the emotions experienced by the biblical characters, and it enables parishioners to share in those emotions, to participate in the story. I would encourage you all to read the recent book of my friend and colleague, Blake Larley, on the narrative shape of emotion in the preaching of John Chrysostom. She shows in that monograph the remarkable degree to which Chrysostom focused on the emotional tenor of biblical stories, especially the emotions of anger, fear, and grief. He vividly describes in his homilies the moods of the various biblical characters, discusses their rational underpinnings, and traces the outcomes for his readers. Sometimes he seeks to calm their nerves, whereas at other times he seeks to arouse their emotions, especially by means of them identifying with the biblical character. Chrysostom provides an important reminder of a point I made earlier this evening. Namely, for your homilies based on the New Testament, do not take an express train from the first and second centuries back to the 21st century. Stop off along the way. 
not only in the fourth century with Chrysostom, but elsewhere throughout the centuries. There is much that we can learn about good preaching from our predecessors in the faith. After all, many of them were far better preachers than the vast majority of us will ever be, and that includes me in particular. But with their help and insights, and with God's grace, we can all be better preachers than we would be otherwise. May God bless you in your preaching and in your listening, and may God bless the Martin program and what it seeks to accomplish. Thank you.